It's a pleasure to welcome Sanjay Kedar. The next two talks are going to be uh, on microbiome as it relates to the eye. Uh, and Sanjay is our uveitis, one of our uveitis specialists here at um, UC Irvine at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. And uh, he has just begun some work with, with uh, Katrina on this. So It's a pleasure to have been invited to speak today. Uh, I'll, I'll focus the majority of my talk uh, with uh, sort of what the possible roles of the microbiome, of the gut microbiome are uh, in ocular inflammation and in uh, AMD. Uh, unfortunately, our project is currently still underway, so I don't have any uh, original data to present to you at the moment, but hopefully next year. Um, so, you know, although despite the title of this symposium, as a clinician, uh, my forays into research are often sort of in the opposite direction, so starting from the uh, bedside to the bench. Um, and this is the particular patient that got me involved in microbiome uh, research. So this was an 80-year-old woman that was one of the first patients that was referred to me uh, here at UCI, and she has something called necrotizing scleritis. And so what you'll notice is that this is an inflammatory disease of the white wall of the eye, which causes necrosis of the tissue and can ultimately lead to uh, erosion of the wall of the eye, loss of the eye, or catastrophic loss of vision. Um, the, about half of these patients, this is thought to be mostly autoimmune in nature, and about half of the patients are noted to have a systemic autoimmune disease. Um, but we really don't understand the whole pathophysiology of what happens. In, um, this particular patient, she was not noted to have any, uh, auto, any, any systemic autoimmune disease. And so like most of these patients, she wound up being put on high-dose systemic steroids in order to quell the inflammation in the eye uh, and save her vision. Uh, many of these patients then go on to need systemic immunosuppressive medications in order to control the disease. I put her on uh, these drugs, but they're not without their risks. Uh, notably, they can render the patient susceptible to uh, life-threatening infections. And so this patient wound up having urosepsis, uh, was hospitalized and treated with uh, broad-spectrum IV antibiotics. So we had to take her off of the immunosuppressive medications while she was fighting this infection. But what was most interesting to me was that after she left the hospital and we were getting ready to put her back on these medications in order to control her disease, she actually was quiet. There was no inflammation in the eye. And she ultimately did not require uh, reinstitution of the immunosuppressive medications after she had been treated. And so that sort of got me interested to find out, well, why would treatment with antibiotics seemingly affect at what we ostensibly is an autoimmune disease. Um, and so that led me to think that, well, it's, it's not so illogical when you think that, uh, you know, as you've heard before, that most of the cells in our body are actually not our own. And uh, the genetic burden of those, of the microbiome is probably outnumbers our own genes by about 100 to 1. So it's not illogical to think that uh, antibiotics, which would affect those processes, could then uh, affect those cells and those genes and uh, affect our own body. So there are uh, certainly many uh, studies over the last several years that have looked at uh, there are patterns that emerge in the intestinal microbiome uh, and the bacteria that compose that that have been associated with uh, diseases that are associated with immune system derangement. And uh, those range from uh, multiple sclerosis uh, to ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis. And these are interestingly all diseases that are associated with ocular inflammation as well. So intestinal dysbiosis or, or an alteration of the commensal bacteria um, is associated with extra intestinal inflammation. In, in patients that are uh, treatment-naive rheumatoid arthritis patients, an analysis of their microbiome shows an increase in uh, certain species, uh, namely Prevotella, and, and decreased in uh, Bacteroides species. And that was different than normal controls. And when they actually then uh, analyzed those, it's interesting that the relative abundance of Prevotella species in those patients is inversely proportional to uh, genetic risk factors for rheumatoid arthritis, which suggests that there, there are actually two sort of different diseases with rheumatoid arthritis, one that includes genetic risk factors and the other one that includes uh, more sort of spontaneous rheumatoid arthritis, that this uh, intestinal dysbiosis may play a greater role or may be more prevalent 
in patients that um, are not genetically uh, at risk for rheumatoid arthritis. With regards to multiple sclerosis, uh, similarly, those patients have also been found in the gut microbiome to have a decreased abundance of Clostridia species, uh, specifically clusters 14A and 4, which are associated with um, the development of T regulatory cells. Um, in mouse models of multiple sclerosis, uh, namely experimental autoimmune uh, encephalomyelitis, those mice, when they're raised in germ-free environments, don't develop CNS inflammation. And when they're treated with antibiotics, similarly, that also reduces the inflammation. When they've transferred microbi microbiota from multiple sclerosis patients into these mice, then it actually triggers inflammation in them. So again, uh, suggesting that there's a strong role for the intestinal microbiome in the development of these diseases, or at least in uh, pr progression of these diseases. Uh, lastly, ankylosing spondylitis, which uh, is associated with uveitis, or inflammation in the eye in about 30 to 40 percent of patients, um, has been also associated with increases in certain types of bacteria and specific patterns of intestinal dysbiosis. Um, when a transgenic rodent model, uh, Dr. Phoebe Lynn up at uh, University of Oregon uh, used a transgenic rat with uh, H human HLA-B27, they actually found increased um, paraprevotella species, which is the same genus that of Prevotella that was noted in rheumatoid arthritis patients, and uh, decreased Bacteroides species uh, with, it was associated with the development of inflammation. But the, it, it's probably not as simple. The, the interactions between the intestinal microbiome and the um, immune system, it's, it's probably not, it's fairly complex, and especially in the gut, and it's probably not as simple as one good actor or one bad actor. Again, there's uh, many studies have shown that uh, segment, uh, in a rodent model, segmented filamentous bacteria are associated with uh, promotion of differentiation of Th17 cells. Uh, which have shown to be pathogenic in m many autoimmune diseases, including uveitis. Um, similarly, Clostridia and Bacteroides species have been associated with enhancing differentiation of colonic T regulatory cells, uh, which, and in subsequent uh, and subsequent development of T regulatory cells in uh, extra extra intestinal sites, including cervical lymph nodes. Uh, sorry, including cervical lymph nodes. So how does this relate to uveitis, which is my area of clinical interest? Um, so uveitis as a clinical entity for us is sort of a heterogeneous group of diseases, and they all seem to have common clinical phenotypes. But the truth is that the sort of pathogenesis of these diseases is not really very well understood. We do know that many of the, these diseases have a very similar um, inflammatory cytokine pathway, namely that they, they uh, and cytokines specifically that have been identified include interleukin-6, interleukin-17, 23, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And when we take ocular fluids as well as uh, serum from these patients, we find that there are elevated levels of these uh, interleukins and these cytokines depending on the particular form of uveitis that it, the patient has. Um, Interestingly, over the last several years, uh, antibody therapy or biologic therapy has been targeted against these specific cytokines in order to treat these diseases. So one of the ways in the lab, uh, the easiest way to sort of uh, study uveitis has been through an experimental autoimmune uh, uveitis model. And in this model, retinal peptide antigen has been administered in conjunction with um, uh, mycobacterial adjuvant in order to induce ocular inflammation. And um, in, uh, again, at the University of Oregon, what they, and this is uh, Dr. Lin's uh, work with um, Dr. Nakamura, they've shown that um, in, these in these mice with EAU, there's definitely a differentiation of the intestinal microbiota in these uh, mice about three weeks after immunization. Um, interestingly, when they're treated with a quadruple cocktail of antibiotics, including vancomycin and metronidazole, um, it seems to attenuate the inflammation, and it increases the expression of T regulatory cells in the um, colonic um, lamina propria uh, of the large intestine, and then subsequently the, 
increases T regulatory cells in cervical lymph nodes and distal sites as well. So again, um, it's, it's interesting that these modification of these microbiota seem to affect uh, inflammation elsewhere, uh, especially in a model of, in an animal model of uveitis. And this is, uh, is Dr. St. Leger here? There he is. So you might, recognize, you might recognize it from your work with Dr. Caspi, um, but uh, the one of Dr. Ka Rachel Caspi at the NIH um, had a spontaneous model of uveitis. And one of the thoughts about uveitis is that autoreactive retina-specific T cells are important uh, in the development of uveitis. And so one of the questions is, well, how are they activated if their uh, sort of cognate antigen is located in an immune privilege site in the eye? How do they then become activated to uh, cause uveitis? And in their work with the spontaneous uveitis model, one of the um, one of the thoughts was that actually they showed that a bacterial antigen in the gut was necessary for activation of these retina-specific T cells. Um, in an experimental autoimmune uveitis model, uh, they've shown that there's enhanced trafficking of leukocytes between the gut and the eye, including Th1 and Th17 cells um, between the gut and the spleen, and that intestinal-derived leukocytes also in the eye correlate with uveitis uh, severity. So again, there's, there's probably reasonably uh, good evidence that there is an important role to play for the gut microbiome in development of inflammation in the eye, both through animal models. There's, there's not sufficient evidence, I think, in humans yet. We're hoping to get some of that. Some of the preliminary data from work at the NIH does suggest that there's some alteration in the microbiome, but there wasn't sufficient numbers of those patients. Um, to come to any definitive conclusions. So the generalizability of these animal studies to humans is not clear. How might it affect other, um, other aspects or other uh, ocular diseases? Well, AMD is one of the diseases that we uh, would be of interest, namely because inflammatory pathways have been implicated in the progression or development of AMD. Um, certainly the uh, NLPR3 inflammasome pathways, toll-like receptor pathways and complement pathways, as well as inna inna innate immunity have been associated with progression of macular degeneration. And all those pathways are, are important in sensing commensal bacteria. When patients with AMD have been analyzed and looking at their microbiome, they found that there are certain patterns that have been associated with AMD. Um, again, uh, this, is, this data comes out of uh, the lab in Oregon, but they've shown that there's been increased uh, abundance, relative abundance of Prevotella species and reduced Ricken, Ricken-Lacea uh, species, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But that's a very similar pattern to what was seen in the ankylosing spondylitis uh, model. ARIDS vitamins, which are uh, at this time the only therapy that's been shown to reduce or slow progression of macular degeneration. Uh, also influence the activity of some of those same species that seem to be uh, incre have increased prevalence in these uh, macular degeneration patients. Um, another study out of Switzerland and at the University of Bern showed that uh, there's increased uh, oscillobacter and aerotruncus versus controls. Again, so it may be that there's, as I stated before, there's probably not, maybe not one particular pattern, but there may be several different patterns that are associated with the development or progression of macular degeneration. So um, this is a very cute large mouse. Um, but uh, so this is the, it, the um, obesity and high fat diets have been associated with progression of macular degeneration. And so in, in a model of choroidal neovascular uh, membranes, so choroidal neovascular membranes, um, the development of blood vessels uh, from beneath the retina is one of the, is associated with sort of the hallmark of wet macular degeneration and is associated with significant visual loss uh, up until we had uh, the development of anti-vascular endothelial growth factor injections. but um, in this model, mice are, uh, a, a laser photocoagulation is applied to the retina, 
and uh, the patients develop, or the, the patients, the mice develop uh, coital neovascular membranes. And what they found was that when they fed these mice high fat diets, there was an increase in progression towards coital neovascular membranes. There was an increase in recruitment of retinal microglia and macrophages to the area of coital neovascular membranes. When they treated those same high fat diet mice with antibiotics, they had a reduction in progression of macular generation. And when they took the uh, sort of derivatives of the microbiota from those high fat diet mice and then transplanted them into regular diet mice, the regular diet mice developed coital neovascular membranes. So again, it's probably strong uh, or relatively strong evidence that there's an influence there with macular generation. So in summary, I think that there's, there's, uh, the gut microbiota may play important roles in uveitis as well as macular generation, and it, it opens up an interesting, or as a clinician, it opens up an exciting sort of avenue that one day we may be able to either manipulate the microbiota or perhaps their metabolites um, to provide novel treatment options for patients. I'll conclude there. Thanks. Not, <laughs> uh, no, and I, and I think that, well, you know, the, the question is whether there is no evidence for it or whether the studies were done incorrectly or, or not to show, not, not adequate to show a correlation. And I think that uh, right now there isn't good scientific evidence to support prebiotic or probiotic therapy, at least as far as I've, I've understood. What was interesting was that, um, Again, Fibulian has used uh, short-chain fatty acids, which were metabolites, intestinal sort of micro, uh, bacterial derived metabolites of dietary fiber, and um, applied those and showed a reduction in inflammation. So if there's one thing I'd say, you know, maybe eat more fiber. Yeah. So right now, because there aren't, there's, there's not that much data on, uh, on the microbiome in uh, uveitis patients in humans, I think we're trying right now to collect both uh, oral and gut microbiome using sort of fecal samples to uh, categorize the microbiome. And ultimately, ideally, if this can work out, clinically with patients, it's not always possible, but trying to, to follow patients individually also, so starting from before they actually become inflamed during the acute inflammation and then during the recovery phase and seeing whether that also may shift. Ultimately, that will then require, I think, animal studies to confirm. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I don't know. And, you know, at least in the, in the, in the patient population that was studied, um, you know, for, from Oregon, it looked like it was very similar to the bacterial signature that you saw in another inflama in inflammatory disease of ankylosing spondylitis. But, um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, there's, there is an element of inflammation that's involved in macular degeneration, and there's certainly associations with complement pathways and things like that. It's, it's maybe not as significant as we see in uveitis, but there may be an element that that, it may not be the whole story, but it may be the partial story to why certain patients progress. There may be there's genetic susceptibility and those patients progress from there. Um, clinically, there is a correlation between sort of nasal, uh, you know, staphylococcus and certain immune diseases like um, granulomatous uh, polyangitis, Weg you know, formerly Wegener's syndrome, uh, in that sometimes those can, those, if there is an increased uh, prevalence of staphylococcus bacteria, they tend to get increased uh, flare-ups, and that's usually a naso nasopharynx-related um, problem. Okay. Thank you.